It's connecting to the cloud. It's recording now. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, I know I hit you with a bunch of questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you did. <laughs> all right. Look, man, if you really want, only want to talk about, like, just one, like, just Iron Man. Or uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through it, and then we'll see, because I got some other things that I need to get to. So we'll see. We'll see how the time goes. Okay. 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 Let's start off with Iron Man. I picked Iron Man because I know this sounds crazy, but to me, he's my favorite superhero because he's a he's a technological superhero. He he gets out of situations with his wits. If you just grant him, you know, the miracle exemption that he's really smart, then most of what he does seems to be realistic. But of course. The question I have to ask is, what is up with the Iron Man suit? I, <laughs> I mean, I've seen the first movie and many people loved it, but I'm just thinking to myself, is it really possible to build an Iron Man suit? I mean, they don't go into much explanation over it, like with the arc reactor or the jet boots and stuff. And so I just want to know where we stand as far as building one. And let's say if you were Bill Gates and with your scientific knowledge, how would you go about building one if you could do it? even in principle, like where do we stand as far as that technology goes? Well, actually, um, so first of all, it's not at all crazy about Iron Man. I think a lot of the appeal of it is that it, you know, seems the most plausible, you know, from a technical, you know, point of view. It's, you know, no one believes that they're going to be able to run at super speed or, you know, be able to turn invisible, but, you know, the suit of armor and everything else, that seems that seems at least within the realm of possibility. Now, um, it's actually extremely realistic, uh, with one big exception. Uh, so certainly, we have we can make um, lightweight, very strong um, armor, you know, and protective armor uh, yeah. that would protect someone. We also, there's um, exoskeletons that have been built that provide force amplifiers. And so that would make you stronger than you would be ordinarily with not wearing the suit. Um, uh, jet boots, rock, you know, jet pack, that type of thing exists. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I loved about the 2008 Iron Man was they showed him as an engineer actually beta testing the, the Mark II suit yeah. um, when he got out of the uh, cave in, in Afghanistan. And that, you know, and he realized, oh, just having the boots doesn't provide enough stability. I've got to also put some stabilizers in the palms of my hands. That was, that was excellent. That was, that was great. Yeah, that was um, And uh, uh, so you have that, and then right away that, those stabilizers, that provides a argument for the repulsor rays, right? You know, in terms of like, I never, it, it's never really been made super clear in the comics, you know, what exactly a repulsor is. Um, obviously it seems like some sort of force beam because repulse, but yeah. um, if you think of it as basically a palm-based jet boot, um, yeah. It makes a hell of a lot, heck of a lot of sense because you know you wouldn't want to you <laughs> if someone had a jetpack that could actually lift them up off the ground and fly them you wouldn't want to get hit with its you know the exhaust stream. I think um, it would vaporize you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, uh, so that part's that part's realistic. Um, the one thing that is not realistic is the energy supply, right? In the, in the movies, he builds an arc reactor, which puts out the power of three nuclear power plants and is the size of a hockey puck. Um, if we had that, you know, we really wouldn't need superheroes if yeah. we had to make so much energy uh, in such a compact form. Uh, that alone is, uh, would be a superpower. Uh, and that, in fact, actually addresses the big downside of everything else that I just described that we have that whereas the technology exists in the Iron Man suit is, um, you know, jetpack, right? Jetpacks exist. We've all seen them. We've seen, you know, back in the 1960s, James Bond and Thunderball, uh, yeah. you know, escape from, 
this castle and goes to a, a nearby car where one of the blonde Bond girls is waiting for him. Um, and that's actually, that part is pretty realistic because going from like the top of the castle and just going down to ground level and going to your car that's parked right outside, that's about the extent of the trip you could take with a jetpack. <laughs> so 15 seconds, huh? 15 yeah, seconds. That, that's about it. I mean, you could take a jetpack to work today, provided you live next door to where you work. Um, the problem is, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to lift you up off the ground and keep you there. And um, there's only so much fuel that you can carry on your back. To, to provide the energy source for the jetpack. And so most, most of these things can't go for very long. Um, you know, unless you go nuclear, right? And yeah. you know, my standard joke about that is that few people are willing to have an unlicensed nuclear power pack on their back who are not a member of the Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, that, that, and, and so we have the technology, we could build an Iron Man suit right now. The reason we don't is you'd also have this enormous, you know, extension cord that runs behind you yeah. to keep, keep you supplied in energy. And oh. uh, so the arc reactor, you know, which is never said explicitly, but it's kind of alluded to that it's a nuclear fusion reactor. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that's the part that requires a suspension of disbelief. That's the part that requires a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and I pointed this out before, one of the things that they get right in the Iron Man um, comics and in the movies that they don't make it ever a big deal about is the fact that his suit responds to his thought commands. We never see him press a button we never even see him give a voice and say, you know, activate repulsor ray, things like yeah. that. You know, it just, he just points, he thinks it, and it happens. And in the comic books, this was explained at one point by saying that he had a cybernetic helmet that picked up his thought waves and um, transmitted them to the suit. And this part is actually accurate, believe it or not, that scientists are when you think there are electrical currents in your brain yeah. um they're not electrons they're ions but it's still an electrical current and electrical currents when they move in, and particularly when they change directions which the currents in your brain are constantly doing they're starting stopping they're going from one neuron to another um whenever that a change in the current happens an electromagnetic wave is generated and this electromagnetic wave is like in the radio wave portion of the spectrum. And it's about a billion times weaker than radio waves. So this is why we don't, um, we're not able to normally uh, detect these. But in the past 10 years, scientists have developed, you know, receivers that you wear on the surface of your head. So you don't have to like drill any holes and insert electrodes or anything just on the surface of your head that can pick up these extremely weight signals amplify them then send them via bluetooth to some other device now they're not doing this to make an iron man suit they're doing this to treat paralysis and make you know improve improvements in prosthetic limbs um because again in a prosthetic limb you're thinking something normally we just think and our hand moves, but um, you want to improve that connection. You want to improve that uh, that functionality. And they have been able to not only pick up these, detect these signals, but at a basic level, in essence, translate them. And so, if you do a uh, look for um, on YouTube, there's a video of with Professor Bin He, B I N, and his last name is He H E. He was at the time he was at the University of Minnesota. Now he's at Carnegie Mellon. And his, if you look for his name and helicopter, you'll see this video of the graduate students in this group wearing this helmet and they're using it to pilot a toy 
remote controlled helicopter uh, through uh, an obstacle maze. And they're able to do it without a joystick, without any you know, control panel, but just by thinking about which way they want the helicopter to go, and it moves through uh, an obstacle course. And so um, in some ways, you know, so this is the thing that the comic books, the science fiction pulps, and all of them kind of missed. Uh, starting back in the 1930s in the science fiction pulp magazines, and then continue on in the comic books, they always thought that by the time we were in the 21st century, we'd have some sort of revolution in energy, which um, is really what you need in order to um, have jetpacks and flying cars. Yeah. What we got instead was we, did, we got a revolution, but it was a revolution in information. And that revolution in information was made possible by semiconductor and solid state physics which in turn was made possible by the development of quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics is the branch of physics that deals with how atoms behave, how they interact with light. Scientists were just trying to understand various phenomena that they had observed that seemed to contradict, that did contradict classical electromagnetic theory, classical thermodynamics. And the quantum mechanics was developed to try to account for this. It led to the world that we have today. Without quantum mechanics, we have no cell phones, no laptop computers, you know, nothing, um, <laughs> no, no internet. I mean, nothing without which, you know, my students would say life is not worth living. <laughs> yes, electromagnetism has revolutionized our entire way of life. Electromagnetism plus quantum mechanics, because quantum yes. mechanics is, you would have electromagnetism and you could use that just alone without an understanding of semiconductor physics, but you would have vacuum tubes and mercury switches as opposed to the small transistors that we have now. So that's the kind of the, that's the big difference um, there is, uh, it's, it was the two together. It was that powerful one-two punch. The electromagnetism, which our understanding of that phenomenon really started Around the time of the American Civil War, it was in the 1860s when Maxwell uh, developed the Maxwell equations to describe electromagnetic waves and realized that light was just simply a form of electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves. Um, that's, that goes back to the, um, uh, the middle of the 19th century. And then you have um, quantum mechanics that really began in the 1920s. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary of Heisenberg and the Schrodinger equation. And um, uh, that similarly led to a dramatic revolution in our, you know, our, our lifestyles about the, the world, the world we live in and how we interact with it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So my theory was that it was antimatter, right? But I'm sure if you know about antimatter, it's first off, producing it is insanely hard. And even if you could, it's, it's so dangerous to store that well, storing it exactly right that's the big problem with antimatter is if it will annihilate itself if it comes into contact with any regular matter then what kind of a bottle do you put it in <laughs> right i remember like, in the first iron man film he's taking he's taking on like he gets shot at with fighter jets and tanks i'm like imagine if that was antimatter that thing would like explode like a exactly no, and actually antimatter, as you point out, does indeed exist. Um, if you wanted to store it, you have to put it in what's called a magnetic bottle because right. antimatter is has an electrical charge and so when it moves, it creates a magnetic field. And if you shape this bottle so that the magnetic field is always gonna repel uh, the antimatter, no matter which way it's going, then you can keep it um, in a little bottle for a while at least. Um, but no, I think it's much, much more uh, quote unquote realistic. <laughs> if, uh, he's got somehow a mini nuclear fusion reaction because at least that nuclear fusion we know, you know that that exists. It's the basis of hydrogen bombs. Um, people have, are working very hard to make prototype fusion reactors to generate electrical power. Um, if 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 uh, if we do manage to pull this off. Um, it would be truly revolutionary. And so 
we just have to figure out, decide, you know, conclude that um, something that has eluded us, real scientists, real engineers, for the past, um, oh my goodness, 80 years, something that we've been unable to do, 70 years at least, that we've been unable to do, Tony Stark was able to do in a cave with a box of scraps. <laughs> so, <laughs> Every Iron Man fan knows that scene. He was able to build this in a cave, oh man. With a box of scraps. <laughs> and then he still couldn't make it. He had to steal it from him to make the Iron Man or suit work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. All right, and <laughs> I love Iron Man. I, I can't, I'd be here all day if I told you how many times I've seen it. All right. Uh, I'm looking at my original drawing of Iron Man by Bob Layton that I have uh in my little makeshift office here right now so um uh when we're when this is over i'll turn on the turn on the video again and i can show that to you okay yes all right and a few more questions about the x-men esp extra sensory perception what do you think that will be so, I told you when so the they're, again, the they're actually it's it's getting back to the cybernetic helmet really? um so as i said you are creating right now you know as you're thinking um, electromagnetic waves and uh, some of them manage to escape from your from your skull and go out into uh, you know the universe the the thing is that the amplitude of these waves is extremely small much smaller than the amplitude of like a, as I say a radio signal um, you, you know you turn on the radio and there you get it right away there's the station and that's because we live in a sea of electromagnetic waves. We never, most of the, a lot of them are at the radio part of the spectrum. We never think about these waves unless we can't get a cell phone signal, right? When you suddenly can have no bars, that's when you notice, hey, where's the, where's the, the radio waves that are normally here? No, but we, otherwise we don't really think about that. We don't um, notice them because they're all around us. It's like being a fish, and they say, hey, boys, how's the water? And you go, yeah. what's water? <laughs> um, so uh, it's the same thing. So you are creating these extremely weak waves. Now, the, the miracle exemption from the laws of nature is that you would have to uh, pose it for uh, the X-Men, for ESP, is that they have some sort of mutation that would enable them to massively amplify the waves that they generate um, and be able and to be super sensitive to the very weak waves that um, are being generated by other people so that you are able to transmit your electromagnetic waves from your thoughts and have them impinge on someone else's brain so that they could basically hear what you're thinking what you're you're saying inside your head and that you would similarly be able to uh, pick up and detect other people's thoughts one of the things um you know in the movies they always show cerebro yeah. as this helmet that professor x is wearing and he's inside this really large round room right um and that's going back to the 2000 first sony uh no a fox um x-men movie so i've always thought that the per reason why cerebro is not in a large circular you know metal room is not so much to um amplify professor x's mental powers but to screen out all the background radio waves that would be around. And for some reason, it, it doesn't screen out at the particular frequencies that Professor X is thinking at. So he's able to transmit his thoughts and to try to hear the thoughts of other mutants. Um, so that would be a reason for why it's, you know, as Wolverine says in the first X-Men movie, boy, that's a big round move. <laughs> yeah. so, it's not so much that he needs to um, amplify his power, but he needs to quiet the background noise. It's like trying to hear someone having a conversation at the other side of the room when you're in a big you know, party 
and there's a hundred other people all having conversations. It's really hard to hear. And what you need to do is get everyone else to shut up so that you can hear the person at the other end. And so, um, but you know, the fact that our brains generate electromagnetic waves is a real phenomena. It's well known. We can detect these waves. We haven't been able to decode them so that, you know, we, we get the waves and we can say, oh, he's, he's saying I'm thinking of a pink elephant or something like that. But um, we're not there at that stage. But who knows? Maybe someday that would be possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Because every time they mention Magneto, I was thinking that he could control electric currents. Of course, the you know the little lies that he could somehow increase the strength of electric currents with the crazy things he does. You know what? They don't really play that up very much. But you're absolutely right because changing electric currents create magnetic fields, and changing magnetic fields induce electric currents. That's this beautiful like you know symmetry back and forth. Um, in the, and you put those two together and you get electromagnetism. And, you know, I, in the comics, I have a strong memory, but then when I was writing the book, I went through all these X-Men issues trying to find the example of this, and I was unable to find it. And I even put, you know, qu queries out on, on message boards, but no one was able to, to give me a citation. But I seem to recall that once the X-Men broke into were kidnapped by Magneto. They were in his like, oh, let's say it was an island hide hideout or something like that. Yeah. They break into his control room and they're gonna disable some device. And they realize that the control panel doesn't have any knobs or buttons. And it's because uh, Magneto was relying on the fact that he could control the electric currents at will. So he didn't need to have control switches or buttons that he was able to just kind of sense where the currents were flowing using his able ability to detect the magnetic fields they were generating and thus be able to um, manipulate those magnetic fields and create his own magnetic fields. He was able to, you know, change the current in the device, which I thought was when I remember the reason it stuck in my head was, it was like, Oh, this is a hundred percent correct. If Magneto had magnetic powers and this is a great, illustration of him using his powers in a new and novel way. And then when I wanted to use it in the book, The Physics of Superheroes, I couldn't find it. I still don't know where the citation is. Maybe if I finally find it, I can convince the publisher to put out a third edition. So I, I don't know if you've seen Days of Future Past, but they somehow capture him. I don't know how they do it. And they put him in a plastic prison. And I was thinking to myself, well, plastic is an insulator, so it blocks electric current. So it would make sense to somehow surround him with that so that... Oh, absolutely. That's, that, that, that's okay. I mean, that, you know, there are, there are, you know, there are still electrons and protons and things that have magnetic fields that can be influenced by Magneto, but he wouldn't be able to have, like, as much control over it as he would over something that was um, a normal metal. Though, you know, most, a lot of metals are not magnetic. Yeah. Um, you can pick up a paper clip using like a, ref a magnet from your refrigerator, but um, you cannot pick up a gold, you know, ring with it. Uh, if, if, you're, if, uh, <laughs> if you're able to pick up any of your jewelry using a, a little refrigerator magnet, I would at least recommend that you check to see whether it's filled with delicious chocolate or not. And then you probably need to have a conversation with someone. Yeah. Where did you get this again? All right. Yeah. Uh, just a, a few more about sure. Superman. I said it in the email. Yeah. Uh, how would you explain his powers? Now, I know this sounds crazy, but hear me out. When I look at like the Superman films, I don't know if you've seen all of them, but when he's flying and stuff, space is warping around him so i was thinking if he could somehow create i don't know gravitational waves or something then maybe he could fly or what would be is that I, I don't think that's a crazy idea at all and in fact um for this i actually will defer to ben tippett who if you do a search online on somewhere on the internet you can find this 
he has a paper <laughs> that he didn't publish, but he wrote a paper that's called The Unified Theory of Superman's Power. And he's basically, I mean, you have basically hit upon the same solution that um, Ben Tippett has, that Tippett said that um, the explanation for uh, Superman's power is that he's able to control inertia. And not, not only his inertia, but the inertia of anything that he touches. So inertia is the aspect of mass that is a reflection of its resistance to move. And the inertia also, the mass of an object also determines its gravitational attraction. But if you could, say, take a building and if you touch it, and suddenly you could reduce its inertia, you know, a thousandfold, you'd be able to pick it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and since it's such a reduced mass, it probably won't even crumble under its own weight, which a real object should, if you were able to pick it up. If you're willing, to, you're able to fly um, because you can change your mass relative to that of the earth. Um, you'd be able to propel yourself because you could create channels of changing inertia in front of you that would pull you forward. Uh, you'd be able to change your direction because if you could just change where that uh, change in inertia is, which if you're just simply jumping, once, you, once your feet have left the ground, uh, that's about it. You know, you're just now a projectile subject to gravity and um, uh, wind resistance. So uh, the fact that Superman is able to fly, fly at great speeds, fly, you know, uh, across the, the to other planets, uh, this would all have super strength, be super invulnerable because you know. If you try to stab him, if you try to shoot him or anything else, he can increase his inertia, you know, an infinite amount so that, you know, it's impossible to deflect, impossible to move, to push him, to harm him in any way. So, um, uh, oops, I lost you. Okay. All right.